know, this week has been a week of revelation. I have discovered what causes every once in a while, if you noticed in some of our videos, there'll be a hiss and static and everything. It's amazing how those things leave when you take the change out of your pocket and the pocket knife out of your pocket. It gets too close to the transmitter, I guess, on my belt. And so, boy, I was, I was changing frequencies and wondering, what on earth? Has somebody put a new wireless system in the center? No, it's just a change in my pocket. Uh, sometimes I think God just does stuff like that, so you just, you're humbled and you realize, yeah, by the time I think I got it all together, I'm just thrown off track by some change in my pocket. This week I probably spent, I don't know, maybe five hours on the phone talking with different people across the body of Christ uh, that are hearing the same thing, what I shared last week about the time that we're in. Uh, some of them understand, one, one is a very prophetic uh, Jewish minister, uh, from, from that side all the way to some folks up in Canada that are just starting to discover their Hebraic heritage. Uh, the pastor up there is very, very prophetic, uh, works a lot in signs and wonders. So in the middle of all this, he's declared a, a Daniel 21-day fast right in the middle of the 10 days of awe and doesn't even know why. He's just following the Spirit of God. And some of the things, things that I'm sharing, I've heard from several other very prophetic people that have a long track record of, of being very accurate or saying the same things. And uh, once we realized that, we just, I, had, I had church on the phone several times this week. It, it's great. When you, you need that confirmation sometimes, don't you? Because when you step out in the prophetic, uh, sometimes it's like stepping off into darkness. And you, you know, Lord, I can't do this. If you don't do it, it's not going to get done. I think that this year and next year, just looking on the Day of Atonement, this year the Day of Atonement is on a Sabbath, so it's a double Sabbath. It happens again next year, the exact same way. And I, 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 think, I kind of think that's a sign and a wonder in itself. Uh, God knows what he's doing. He knows what's going on. Even though many other leaders in the world, you realize you wake up one morning and either realize they have no clue what's really going on or just simply that they're being told what to do and they're nothing more than puppets on somebody else's agenda. But how many know there's no strings on God? He's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. Nobody can mess with it. Nobody can outthink him, outdo him. In fact, from his perspective, it's already a done deal. I like serving a guy like that. Today is the Day of Atonement. I want to read the, the basic scripture in Leviticus chapter 23 regarding the Day of Atonement. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. Now, that's almost like a repeating it twice, isn't it? A rest of rest. But I think God's trying to make a point here. A Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. And I think there's a lot into this, and I want to really touch on dealing because the Day of Atonement is the return of the Lord. It is the Day of the Lord. It's that divine rehearsal that we, we're trying to get back into synchronicity with heaven. How many know that we have really been off? And, our, and, and when, you, when you look at the, the blessed hope of, of the Lord's return, over the last 2,000 years, there have been ebbs and flows in Christian theology regarding it. Uh, one of the best works is called The Blessed Hope by George Ladd, which uh, the very first chapter, he just goes and he historically looks at how the church looked at it. And the early church fathers all believed that they were going to go through the tribulation period and that it was part of the purification process and that at the end of the tribulation period, the Lord would come back and we would go and we would meet the Lord in the air. 
And then you have the Catholic Church taking over, and they believe that their job was to conquer the planet and that, and that the Pope was the embodiment of Christ. He was the vicar of Christ in the earth. Well, where in the world did they get that? Well, when you go back into Egyptian mythology, the Pharaoh was the embodiment of Osiris. Exact same thing. And so this blessed hope of the Lord's return was completely lost and done away with. Then at the Reformation, it began to come back. But in the Middle Ages and in the 18th century, they, they got into something called post-millennialism. That meant that we were already at the, the, there is no literal millennial reign of Christ, and this is kind of good as it gets. And uh, I look at post-millennialism, and I think, you want to talk about a disappointment, I, it's, it's like you, you, I, I can't, for, for me, I can't wrap my head around post-millennialism or all-millennialism. I can't wrap my head around it, especially when you, when you look in Scripture. But during the, the 18th century, that was the predominant uh, theological position among all the evangelicals, the Protestants. And so there was no expectancy of the Lord's return. There was no blessed hope. Then the turn of the 19th century, the body of Christ began to rediscover the second coming of Jesus, even before the formation of dispensationalism. In fact, dispensationalism hopped on top of the major thrust of the body of Christ rediscovering that Jesus is going to come back. Now, for us in the 21st century, look at that and say, how could anybody not think the Lord's going to come back? But it was there. And really the pre-tribulation part of it was like 1% of that entire movement. It just rode on the wave of rediscovering of the blessed hope of the Lord's return. And after the wave kind of began to do this, many of the proponents that were in on it with the Plymouth Brethren, there was a big thing up in Canada with it, and, and then embraced in America that many of them later on renounced the pre-tribulation rapture, including two of the editors of the Schofield Bible. You're, you're not told a lot of that, but it, it's the truth. But we need to, how many to realize the Lord is coming back? He is coming back. Can you imagine these guys watch Jesus ascending into heaven, and we pick up here in Acts chapter 1, it said, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, not another Jesus, this same Jesus jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner when ye shall see uh, as ye have seen him go into heaven that's the blessed hope that he is coming back how many know that we're closer to that than any other time before us in fact when you look at in god's economy how it works from from the the fall of man to abraham was two thousand years give or take a few years from Abraham to Jesus was about 2,000 years. And how many know from the Lord to his return is going to be about 2,000 years? And I think where we make the mistake, we try to calculate it at his birth. Did you know that, that uh, there's not a lot of significance giving in the word of God about his birth? It was to show that it was miraculous, that it was a virgin birth. But to give honor to births, like your birthday is pagan, it's not Jewish, they never did it. The Bible doesn't say remember his birth. It says to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. There might be a reason for that because maybe the 2,000 years started at the resurrection. Or we also have the prophecy that he was two days among the Samaritans with the woman at the well. And so among the Gentiles, he was going to be 2,000 years before his return, which means we would need to calculate it about the time that... Uh, that Peter went down to Cornelius' home about 35 years after the Lord resurrected or something like that. So some of it's kind of, we, 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 we kind of know the times and the seasons, and there's a lot of different prophecies and different things I'll look at. And, you know, if he wants to come back tomorrow, I'm fine with that. Come on, Lord. It's not like, Lord, I got one more thing I want to do. It's like, if you come, I'd, everything else can just get put on hold forever. I'm out of here. 
But at the same time, I'm planning for a return about 2030 to 35. That's just kind of where, I, where I'm falling as far as my eschatological views. But I won't be disappointed if he comes back tomorrow. If he came back before Obamacare kicked in, that would be a sign and a wonder. <laughs> all, the, all the unions are trying to get their exemption. How many know that would be the ultimate exemption? We need to realize that looking for the Lord's return. See, if the early, the, the, when we see the, the, the Protestant movement getting into amillennialism and postmillennialism, if it understood the feast, it would have never went that way. Because every year in the fall, we hear the trumpet sound, the Lord's return. We have the ten days of awe of giving the final warning to the earth. We have the day of atonement, which is the day of the Lord, the valley of Armageddon. All these different things, and that, that, is, that is a part of our makeup of, of the, the, prophetic si- the prophetic signs of the kingdom. And we would celebrate tabernacles every year, realizing that there is a real millennial reign coming. When you put the, you know, it's, it's amazing how crazy and off you can get when you take the feast out of the equation. You put the feast back in, it's like, ah, oh, no, I get it. There's, there's something important about the feast. And so as I, as I look to his coming, Look what we find here in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. How many are glad you're born again this morning? You're a son or daughter of God. Not born by flesh and blood, not born by the will of man, but born by the will of God. But he goes on to say, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So how many know that you're not done yet? Aren't you glad? But we know that When we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall be as he is. Now look here at verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now the thing that I've got to look at, you have to look at the fruit of something, don't you, to really understand it. It doesn't matter how dynamic the argument can be if, if, if it's giving you bad fruit when you look at, the, look at it going over a period of time. When I look for the Lord returning and I understand that I may need to go through some things in the tribulation period, I understand that there are these 10 days of all that every year teach me to make sure everything is right between God and man, and I'm looking for his return, holiness becomes important to the believer. The imminent return, at any moment return, and pre-tribulation rapture has not bolstered holiness. It has promoted hyper-grace. Since it has been embedded into the theology, has the body become more worldly or has the body become more holy? Holy moly. Have we gotten worldly? Because God's going to get me out of here before I go through anything. Tell that to the Christians living today in Egypt, in Syria. Our government supported a government that was crucifying Christians in the streets. Tell them they're not going to have to go through anything before the Lord comes back. Go to China and the long history in China of Christians being killed for their faith or in the Muslim countries that Christians have died for their faith and tell them they're not going to have to go through anything before the Lord comes back. And many of them have more spiritual fortitude than any American that I have ever met Because as they're giving their lives, they're saying, we are not worthy. See, there was a time in Japan. Brother Kevin up in Canada is Japanese. And there was a time when Christianity began to take hold in Japan and they were still worshiping the emperor. And so they would parade these Christians down the streets to their death, hoping that they would recant 
before they got there. When they got there, if they didn't recant, then their, their, heads were be, their heads would be cut off by the samurai warriors. And as they walked down the streets, instead of recanting, they would say, we are not worthy. We're not worthy to give our lives for Jesus. And as other believers stood in the crowd, that even the, the, the other people may not have known that they were Christians, they would step out and join and begin to say, we are not worthy. Somehow or another, I see some holiness. I see some spiritual testosterone. I see some strength. When the way that our theologies have gone today in America, the body of Christ is effeminate and limp-wristed. When we are called to be the great army of the Lord... There's no strength because we have been looking to something other than his return as a conquering king and that we had better line up with him. Here's what the Day of Atonement teaches us. Number one, the Lord is returning. I like that. He even tells us this from the very beginning on how he's going to deal with man. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, what you don't understand, if you don't have any comprehension of, of Hebrew, is in this text, in the, in the creation text, prior to Genesis 2, 7, it was only Elohim. Elohim did this. Elohim did that. Elohim said. Elohim said. And the minute he begins to go and make man, it is Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. Only at the creation of man. And the devil didn't get it because when the devil showed up in the Garden of Eden, he said, has not Elohim said? He didn't know nothing about this Yahweh stuff. He didn't know God by that name. The Tetragrammaton, the most holy name of God, yod heh vav -Heh, Lucifer, who thought he was hot stuff, did not understand that name. But God introduces himself by Yahweh Elohim the moment that he puts his hands in the dirt to make man. Why is that so important? Number one, Jesus is is encoded in the Tetragrammaton. In Hebrew, every letter has a meaning. Yod means hand. Hey means to be, it's, it's like an opening door. When you look at, look at, at, at a hey, it's like a, something's being opened. And so it's a revealing, it's a beholding. And vav is nail. And so it can be interpreted, the God with the nailed hand shall be revealed twice. I mean, no, that's good. But the rabbis say that the, tetragram the Tetragrammaton Yahweh deals, that name deals with the grace and love of God. So when, when they see yod heh vav -Hey, that means God's giving forth grace. Elohim means justice and judgment. So when God created man, he had to balance mercy and justice together. At the same time, what he's telling us, Jesus is encoded in Yahweh. So Jesus, when he came the first time, he came to not judge the world, but to save the world. And see, the problem with the world today is they think that this Jesus that is willing to give up his life for mankind is going to come and do it again. They look at it, and instead of seeing love and compassion, they see weakness. And I know this because I have dealt with too many coming from the occult that the minute you show compassion to them, they interpret that weakness. Someone coming from the occult, you've got to be up in their face about stuff because the minute you show any kind of compassion, they look for an advantage to take. And see, for them... There's only Elohim. Because the second time he comes, 
First time he came as Yahweh, the second time he's coming as Elohim. How many know that when he's on that white horse and he's coming down through and he begins to judge things, it's too late to get right? It's too late. You rejected him as Yahweh in the compassion of God, and now you will only know him as the divine justice of God who rejected his sacrifice. The second coming is about holiness. The Apostle John reminded us that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is a pure. The ten days of all reminds us of the purposeful purification process that must happen in the heart of every believer to prepare for his coming. And it's not just the ten days of all. This is called personal sanctification. How many that I should be more holy this year than I was last year? I should be more holy next year than I was this year. Because the Holy Spirit's working on me, and I'm yielding to his working. I am the clay, and my job is to yield to the hands of the Most High. Most of the body of Christ has jumped off the potter's wheel and are stuck on the song, Just As I Am. you got to take me just as I am. Some of them are trying to sing, I did it my way. I am to continually yield. Why are there 10 days of all? We dealt with last week that 10 is the number of days of a wedding feast. But also 10 is the biblical number of testimony, law, and responsibility. You see, when I realize I got to maintain my testimony in the earth and I am accountable to God on how I maintain that testimony of not only who I am in him, but who he is, Things change in your life. That's why the Bible says we're going to be, we're going to be judged for every idle word. We're, we're, we're going to be judged for what we do in the earth. How many know as a believer there is a judgment for you coming? Now, it is not the great white throne judgment because there it's do not pass go, do not collect $200. You got a ticket straight to the lake of fire. How many know we have been delivered from that? But you will still be judged for your works. And the feast tell us never appear before the Lord empty-handed. You can only bring before him what you allowed him to do in you. Come on. And so I got to have this process of me having a testimony, me coming in line with God's law. I read one thing, and I, boy, it's, it's, it's a good thing they had the comment section turned off, and it was actually done by a Bible software company where they put out little articles, and one of them was, what do we do about the law? And everybody's talking about the commandments of God, and without giving one scripture to mandate his conclusion, he said, Jesus lived the law so we wouldn't have to. And I'm thinking, no, Jesus went to the cross so that I could live it, because there's a new birth. And now his commandments have been written on my heart. I'm going to be judged by how I walk according to God's law. Now, it's not a salvation issue as it is a sanctification issue. And I have a responsibility. In an age that everything is entitlement, the believer says, I am entitled to walk with God because of the blood. And because of that, I am responsible to walk in his commandments, to obey his voice. And I'm responsible for the testimony of who he is that I made in the earth. The second coming also reminds us of his justice. When the Lord comes back, those who are not humble before him are given a second chance. No. They're cut off. How many know cut off ain't good? I just wanted to throw that out there. Because I, I find sometimes you know, people have a hard time maybe getting something. <laughs> Cutting off means to be destroyed. If I don't humble myself before God, and how many know when you wrestle with your sin, you've got to humble yourself to come to the cross? Then after that, you've got to humble yourself to crucify your flesh. You've got to constantly humble yourself. God knows more than you do. And you owe more to God than he could ever owe to you. Come on. 
I want to look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And there's time for us to become judges. You're going to have to learn to judge yourself. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but that w but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Notice things, not people. Things in you. Things that are important to you. Things going on in your life. I got to judge them according to the word of God and what the Holy Spirit is showing me as he makes this word come alive in me. I've got to learn to judge myself and say this is clean, this is unclean, this is holy, this is profane. I keep this, I get rid of this. The total opposite of what's being taught today in Christian television that it's all good. No, it's not. There is holy, there is profane, there is clean, there is filthy. There is sin, there is righteousness. Why aren't they saying these things? They're listening to another spirit, the spirit of this world that has perverted the gospel. Because how I many know maybe the Apostle Paul had just a little bit of understanding of what Jesus did for us? They actually used the man's writings who wrote this to get us to ignore what he wrote. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, if I was the Apostle Paul, it's like, Lord, I, I know that you know, I'm going to rest when you come back because there's, there's this divine rest. On, on, on the Day of Atonement, you have a Sabbath and a rest. That's because God's going to do it. There's nothing. You know, I don't, I don't have to declare jihad on the world. I'm not going to do anything but sit back and watch God take care of it. There's nothing I can do to add to it. I don't have to take out God's vengeance on the earth. He's big enough boy to do it himself. Okay? He, he's got it under control. But the spirit of this world, is, the, there, there's no discernment anymore in the body. How I many of there used to be a time in the body of Christ if you were in ministry and you committed adultery, your ministry was over? Now you're lucky to be sidelined for six weeks depends on how much money your ministry's making. How I many of that's worldly wisdom? Sin is blinked at, turned a blind eye to, but people poke fun at other believers actually trying to live this thing. And I've actually had people tell me, I'm, I have liberty in Christ not to do any of that. I'm thinking, no, you don't. You have liberty in Christ for the first time in your life to be able to do that because you were doing all that other stupid stuff before you got saved. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged in no man. Why is he judged in no man? Because he's cleaning house himself. That gets you to the place where you're blameless before men. You'll see reading throughout the New Testament. They, they tried to find aught with him, but they couldn't find it. James, the brother of Jesus. How many know he gave his life in Jerusalem for the Lord? And even those on the Sanhedrin that hated him called him Jacob because his name wasn't James. It was Jacob. They called him the righteous because he was so zealous a Torah that they looked at the commandments of God and looked at his life and said, I can't find one thing you're missing, Jack. But they, and, and they so and they said, this, this renounce Jesus and it'll be okay because you, you keep, you know, you're a model to us of keeping the law. And they, they said, give him one more chance. And he got up on this wall and they said, now just before all the people renounced Jesus, and he started preaching Jesus. That's when they killed him over it. They couldn't find anything against him except they didn't like him preaching Jesus. Let me tell you something. 
You're walking right with God if your worst enemy that hates you the worst can't find anything wrong about you except that you preach Jesus. Maybe you're where you should be spiritually. No man can judge you. Now, they can make up lies about you. Don't worry about lies. Don't worry about gossip. You know why? Gossip shows the desperation of the enemy. If he can't find anything real and solid to say about you, he'll get people lying about you because he ain't got nothing. He, would he waste his time doing that if he could actually say, this is what he's doing? Let's just bring this out. Boy, boy, if this, boy, if this secret sin come out, it'll all be over. If he can't find that, he's got to get people to lie about you. That's why Jesus said, just rejoice when people talk about you bad and, and are making all this stuff. And speak about you falsely. They did the same thing. Jesus' own family at the beginning of the Gospels, now it, it's kind of waxed over in the King James. His mama and his brothers and sisters were out there and they said, he is beside himself. You know what that meant? At the beginning of his ministry, his own family said, he's lost it. Spent one, two minutes. Guy goes out in the wilderness and he has come back with heat stroke. <laughs> it's not been right since he went out in the wilderness. I mean, know oh, it was the devil limping after he got through in the wilderness. The devil had to leave him for a season, licking his wounds. The feasts also teach us that his blood can only cover the humble. If you don't humble yourself and come under the blood before he returns, you don't get the blood when he returns. Either you accept his shed blood or your blood gets shed. Do you ever think about it that way? Well, Mike, how can you say that? Well, I've actually read the prophets. They say that when he returns, that the entire width, uh, the, the, the entire length and width of the Valley of Armageddon, blood will flow as high as a horse's belly, and they don't ride pygmy horses over there. They ride very long-legged horses over there. All those people, their blood is shed because they would not accept his blood. Only when I humble myself. The Bible says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so some of the things that this feast teaches us is those that, are, that humbled themselves before the king is what this is about. This is what humbling is. I've humbled myself before the king and those that rest in his completed work. I can't add anything to the cross. But what I need to learn how to do is to live in the cross. Live by the power of the cross. Live by, live by his completed work. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, never let I live. Yet if not I, it is Christ living in me. It, it's, guys, whatever, Paul was saying, whatever you see wonderful within me, it's not my work. It's his work in me because I've surrendered I've humbled myself. I've brought myself oh, under the king, and now the king is able to live through me. And if you're living for the king, when the king comes back, how many know the king isn't going to have a problem with you? The epitome of Antichrist, I believe, is going to be self. And they're going to amalgamate it. And I don't know how this is going to amalgamate with transhumanism and Islam and all these different things. But they're going to literally think that they have, they have, re, have uh, approached apotheosis, that they have approached become godlike. And there's some stuff very close on the horizon. Do you know that they're saying that the whole concept of aging can be put to a standstill? I mean, some of the genetic stuff that they're, that they're talking about, just on, the, just on the horizon of doing. And I think it's probably going on somewhere in some back lab somewhere. 
Come take the mark of the beast and you'll get this inoculation and you'll never age and never have to worry about sickness and disease and never have to... I already know what's going to happen with that. Not only do you lose your soul, but you're going to end up with boils on one side from one end to the other. And you want to die and you can't die because your body regenerates. That death won't even touch you. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? I mean... <laughs> Come on, mountain, fall on me. Maybe if I get squished enough, maybe I could die. God had this thing all figured out before they did. I'm, I'm just amazed with some of the news coming out. It, it, if, if you don't really keep track of this, a lot of things are coming out with uh, the, the transhumanism movement. Just this last week, this, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're trying to resurrect dinosaurs through genetic manipulation. How many know having a T-Rex in your backyard is probably a bad idea? Because when he looks at you, all he sees is one word, lunch. Okay, that's a bad deal. But now they're saying that they're beginning to take Nephilim DNA and are going to begin crossbreeding it with insects. I'm thinking, have you read the book of Revelation? Looks like a locust has a face of a man flying and it has a polyon on the side. I've looked at that and think, you know, maybe it's an Apache helicopter. Maybe instead of a Pollyon, it was Apache. No. I think we're going to see some hordes of hell, of, of some things loosed. Man in his supremacy to recreate creation is going to loose hell upon himself. That's part of the judgment. Have you noticed, even the last couple of weeks, there are certain things that God is trying to put emphasis back on to holiness, and as governments and state agencies and, and uh, are, are trying to just basically say, I don't care what God says, we're going to do it this way. All of a sudden, there's floods and there's fires, and there's, that's just the beginning. That's, that's just birth pains. God's saying, well, if you do this, just do this. I'm waiting not for California to fall off the face of the nation. I'm waiting for it to go up on a puff of smoke, and it's about ready to do it. How many have seen all the fires in California going on right now? Do you know this is not even the fire season yet? The Santa Ana winds have not even kicked in yet. Could you imagine what's going to happen as they get into the real fire season? The whole thing may burn down. Or section. I, I see God's spot judging. So how can we bring God's blessings? How many know in Missouri we, we have a bumper crop of hay this year? Last year they were having to bring it out of state. One of the reasons is there have been some prayer and fasting going on by many church groups all across Missouri. And I think there's a, a lot of believers and a lot of voters just about fed up with some things that are going on. I'm, I think there's going to be a surprise in November with a lot of the elections in Missouri. And there's some other places, too, that's going on. You're going to see, guys, this, this, it, it, where we're headed prophetically, it can get to the place to where everything on this side of the road could be decimated. On this side of the road, it's like a Garden of Eden. God's blessing is going to be where it is, and there's going to be this delineation mark. God's cursing is over here, and God's blessing is over here. And I don't know about you, but I want in the blessing. I want to learn from the fall feasts and learn to walk humble before my God and to make sure that I'm blameless before him, to have those blessings. Well, Father, I thank you this morning for the truth of your word, the truth of your kingdom, Father, and the truth of your feasts. Father, let us be cognizant of what the Spirit of God is trying to get us to discern in our own lives. And Father, we ask, Father, we humble ourselves and say that we can't get this right without you. We can't see unless you show us. We can't hear unless you speak. And, Father, we ask in every single area of our lives, Father, this for a new supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit to, to humble us, to prepare us. Father, we want to purify ourselves because we are looking for your coming. And, Father, as we do, we're going to see your blessing. We're going to see your empowerment in real and new ways. Father, we thank you for it. We praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.